Hello, it's Jeremy Black and Richard Toy from the History Department at the University of Exeter. We teach a course on newspaper history, and this is for the students on the course, but also for those more broadly who might be interested. We're going to talk today about two things that are distinctive about Britain, what really, uh, not unique to Britain, but distinctive, certainly, that's the development of parliamentary government and the development of the mass popular press. What we're going to actually look at is the relationship between the two and to ask the question more narrowly on the one hand, how did the press reporting of Parliament develop and change? But also, which in a sense is more interesting, is is it the case that what one means by a free press, which could obviously be variously debated, is in a sense necessary or constitutive of a free parliamentary system in the modern age and vice versa? If you don't have a, a essentially liberal representative system, do you in fact risk not having a free press? Now, I was going to ask Richard what he thought about that that latter adage, which I've just sort of thought about. Well, I mean, I think I think that um, it's a very important question that you raise, and what I would say is that you know, you've got the possibility of having parliamentary reporting, and then you've got the question of whether you actually really have any meaningful parliamentary reporting. And so if you look at today's newspapers, you will see remarkably little uh, parliamentary reporting, in fact. And uh, you may get a sketch, a sort of a humorous sketch, which sort of pokes fun at the politicians. There may be, um, you know, the occasional other report about, you know, what happened at Prime Minister's Question Time, which is something that is quite well reported. But Unlike 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, there's no way that you're going to open up your newspaper and see a uh, you know, pretty much verbatim uh, speech by the Prime Minister that you know, sort of apparently it was expected in those days that people would actually sit down and, and read it, and presumably some people were actually doing that. Now, the interesting question is, does this matter? Is this a problem uh, for democracy? Um, and you could argue that actually, well, no, it isn't, because although the newspapers aren't doing it, um, there are ways which the citizen can access that material. You can find Hansard, the you know, the daily report of the House of Commons, very, very easily on the web. That's something probably much more easily accessible to people today uh, than the printed version of Hansard would have been, you know, a few decades ago. Um, you know, but on the, at the same time, I think that um, you know, one does maybe feel a certain amount of regret for the fact that actually all these people are standing up and making speeches, um, you know, putting a considerable amount of effort and thought into it, perhaps. And yet, um, there's not you know, an analysis of what they're saying isn't actually part of uh, a big part of our, our journalistic discourse any longer. So there are two things there to think about for the listener. One, is it the case that there is diminished reporting of Parliament because there is a sense, accurate or otherwise, that power has leached away, maybe the power has leached away to the European Union, maybe power has leached away to international institutions of other types? That's one question. And the second question related to that is, insofar as there is reporting to, of Parliament, does it fail to actually grow asked where Parliament may be important. In other words, I, I would suggest that it under-reports the uh, select committees, mm. uh, which often play a very major role uh, as, uh, as an arm of Parliament. So there is that dimension of it, but there's also, Richard brings up the historical dimension, and it's, it is interesting that in the 18th century, in the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution, there was a struggle contested through uh, both the columns of the press, contested through the law courts, in order to report Parliament. Now, one, the old-fashioned way of looking at that, one would take a highly Whiggish account and say this was a key element in which people felt ownership in the political process. And, you know, obviously some of that Whiggism can seem ludicrously self-congratulatory, but I think it does count capture, in fact, a reality that if you had governments such as, for example, uh, the Walpole government, which had a degree of unpopularity, there's no doubt about it, but which nevertheless wins very comfortably the 1727 or the 1734 general election or the Lord North government, which does the same um, in, in, you know, in 1770, oh dear, you almost caught me out there, 1780, for example, and, um, you know, if you've got that, uh, that, that situation, is it the case that, in a way, 
the press is seen as being significant, A, as a way to draw attention to the opposition in Parliament and to say, yes, the government has the majorities, but one needs to be aware there is another voice there and we need to think seriously about that voice. And then, of course, if you're an opposition newspaper, to say that voice represents the people, whatever the people means, which is another question. And also, is it the case that uh, an awareness of the press reporting is in fact the practical nature of parliamentary accountability. That the original theory of parliamentary accountability is that people uh, uh, produced instructions to their MPs and addresses um, to Parliament and to the Crown, and that these would be, as it were, you know, received and then deliberated upon and generally ignored. And is in, in a sense the press, um, you know, one has to be cautious about the language of modernity, but is the press the, as it were, the 18th century modern type of that form of accountability, just as new media have become so more recently. Uh, and it also, what you're saying raises another interesting question, I think, which is actually when we talk about parliamentary reporting, the way that we started our discussion was very much about parliamentary reporting in the newspapers, and yet the, the actual importance of the official record, Hansard, it is actually crucial, and it's maybe a more complicated document than um, you know, people might think. So that you know, up until the Edwardian period, um, the, the, there weren't people who were employed um, directly by Hans, Hansard to be uh, you know, transcribing the debates as they, they went along. They were very often relying on the accounts which appeared in the newspapers, which were perhaps not 100% accurate. Um, similarly, you know, even up to, until today, uh, politicians have the right to go to the parliamentary reporters and if they feel that they have misspoken um, they uh, have the right to at least tidy up their language they're not really supposed to change the substance of what they said yes. but they can they can make it look as though they were perhaps a little bit more uh, fluent and grammatical than in fact had been the case and so you know what looks at face value if you go to say the Cambridge University Library and look at the the, uh, you know, the volumes of Hansard upon the shelf you know, it's a completely authoritative record of, of everything that was said, but it, it possibly wasn't everything that was said, and it may have been you know, some things. It may report some things that actually were never well, said. I think that's definitely the case. And if you look at uh, Hansard's predecessors, for example, William Co Cobbett's parliamentary history, uh, which again drew on in part on newspaper and magazine reports, but indeed also in the reports in the newspapers themselves, they would often tell you, or other people would often tell you, how long a speaker was on, particularly if they were a famous speaker. On the whole, in Parliament in the 18th and early 19th century, far fewer people spoke. Many MPs didn't speak very much. Some didn't speak at all. Uh, but the great, what were known as the lions, the celebrities, people like Edmund Burke, Charles Fox, William Pitt the Younger, they would be speaking, they, people would listen to them, and they would record. And these people would say, you know, Mr. Pitt spoke for an hour and a half. Well, you can then actually read aloud what we have of his speech. I mean, I've tried this. I did a book on Parliament and Foreign Policy in the 18th century, and there's no way that the, rec the, the record that we have would have taken an hour and a half. So that does raise all sorts of issues. It's very interesting here. I mean, in my view for the 18th century, there is, in a sense, a sense of rhetorical conventions in which people are often seen in light of um, as it were, the modern senators, the modern Cato, the modern Cicero, and that conditions both the, report, the words attributed to them in some respects, and also the, as it were, the way in which Parliament is presented. I, I so happen to think, and, you know, I read quite widely in parliamentary reports that, uh, and parliamentary accounts, that it was often a degree more disorderly, raucous, mm -hmm. confused, messy, which is not surprising. It was a crowded room without air conditioning, where people were generally overfed and sort of not short of a little bit of alcohol, a lot of alcohol, and it's not surprising that it was often a bit disorderly. Equally, uh, if we move through to the, the, um, the 1920s, um, then there's also sometimes the suspicion, which the, you know, the politicians often voice, they're not particularly happy about it, is that some of these disorderly scenes, which certainly do occur, are actually sort of spiced up by the reporters and made to seem more significant than they really were, simply because reporting Parliament is a bloody boring job. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And yes. so, um, you know, you have all these uh, sort of difficulties of interpretation, things that look like sort of wonderful, colourful descriptions and the historian might, oh, you yeah. Use that. That's that's perfect. To, you know, really evokes the atmosphere. Um, and yet, some somebody there could be some degree of fabrication there. 
Well, I think that's definitely the case. So we, we're, we're fairly convinced that the accounts are less than completely accurate. Um, not that that doesn't describe every form of historical source I happen to hasten to add. But we're also left with the issue we raised at the outset, which is that the reporting of Parliament itself has changed very considerably during the age of press reporting. And again, we have this problem of looking back to what we've referred to in one of these other programmes as a heroic age of the late 19th century, and the assumption that then the reporting was most comprehensive, most accurate, and that people, as it were, deliberated in the reading rooms of public libraries the length and breadth of the country, or in the, you know, in, in, in over, over their morning tea, they read and heard what, and thought about what Mr. Gladstone and Mr. Disraeli had said the previous day. And to a certain extent, that may well be true. Just because that sounds ridiculous, it doesn't mean it's necessarily not the case. But also it can be too easy to assume this. And with newspapers, we do know that one of the central problems is determining what is read in a newspaper. And the fact that there is extensive copy on parliamentary reporting does not necessarily mean that it's a key element of the reading concerns. It means that it can readily be reported. That's true. Um, and so therefore, and this I think is always the case in newspapers, and we very much hope the listeners will think about this, it's not a question that we're, as it were, passing down some grave, you know, sort of texts and this is as it was. The whole point about newspapers is that understanding newspapers is very much an interactive process, and we very much ask people to, in a sense, look at old newspapers and to think not just about the copy as a curiosity, but the copy within the context of what they know of the political culture of that period. Period. And that's certainly what we would like the students to do, but we would like more broadly those listening to think in those terms and also to be aware that that's the terms and the context within which we should look at newspapers and other media today. And if I might close, I would make a simple point. People often criticise the press and talk about how it's on its way out. I think that if you actually consider the volume of words in a modern newspaper, which of course is incomparably greater than that in an 18th century or uh, even 19th century newspaper, you would be aware that there is a vast wealth of material covered. Um, clearly one can always put, put points to omissions and commissions one disagrees with, emphases that one dis deplores, but nevertheless there is an enormous amount covered on all sorts of social, political, artistic and other economic trends. And in a way it would be an enormous pity if that was discarded because you only have to turn to the internet and television to be aware that although there is a mass of material there, it is very rarely shaped as uh, carefully um, and deliberatively and allowing you to move through a vast amount of material as a newspaper is. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.